want to talk about these two conditions here because they, they are highly, highly prevalent. Um, this is something that most urologists see. You see commonly in your practice. You hear about it at dinner parties. It surrounds us and it somewhat defines us a little bit as, uh, as uh, urologists, is that managing, how do we manage these conditions? We are the content experts on this. So overactive bladder, just to put a little bit more context behind it, very, very common. Uh, probably underestimating between 30 and 50 million women worldwide have uh, uh, overactive bladder. I think it's much higher prevalence, actually. There was a good kind of epidemiologic study in 2005, which was just a questionnaire study, 3,300 women, 42% had some symptoms consistent with overactive bladder. So it's very, very common. Interstitial cystitis, also very common. Um, we have good data, actually, from the uh, RAND interstitial cystitis epidemiologic uh, uh, study, which is the RICE study, prospective following uh, uh, women with, sit with questionnaires. And you know, these screening questionnaires, it shows somewhere between, depending on what symptoms you're focusing on, 2 to 17% of U.S. adults have interstitial cystitis by questionnaire definition. You know, men, it's probably more common than prostatitis. We tend to underestimate that a little bit. And what's interesting about this is following these questionnaires is that these symptoms persist, and you know that from your clinics. 41% have clinics that last over a month, over a year. And so the problem is, is we really don't understand the full depth of these two conditions. And more important, how to really differentiate between them very well. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about today, is what are some of the similarities? You know, we'll talk about the definitions, because definitions are important about how we compare. I'll we'll talk about how we diagnose, and then some treatment algorithms to help you kind of differentiate and uh, bring that back. So to start, what exactly is overactive bladder? Now, we look at the definition from the uh, International Consultation on Incontinence Research Society, which is essentially just a group of content experts, and really they define it uh, uh, through peer review as, as urinary urgency with or without ur or urgency incontinence, usually with increased daytime frequency in nocturia. And no, this is a clinical definition. There's no mention of urodynamics here. So again, taking the history and the clinical definition is what is important. Interstitial uh, cystitis definition, look at this definition though. This is also from, uh, this is from the AUA Interstitial Cystitis Guidelines, 2014. And I'll just read it. The unpleasant sensation, pain, pressure, discomfort, perceived to be related to urinary bladder associated with lower urinary tract and symptoms of greater than six weeks uh, uh, duration. Putting those side by side, they're actually quite similar. And so you have very similar uh, uh, definitions of two different conditions somewhat. Interstitial cystitis is really kind of very difficult to define sometimes, and there's a good paper that came out in 2019 that looked at all the society definitions and national guidelines of 10 different uh, uh, published papers, and the commonalities that they found were pelvic pressure and pain associated with lower urinary tract symptoms, specifically frequency urge was noted uh, interestingly in 10, um, and then some associated ones. And so interstitial cystitis tends to be a little bit broader than overactive bladder in some of the definition criteria. And the first take-home point is, is that the way I like to differentiate these two is that I tend to think of interstitial cystitis much more on the sensory component, whereas overactive bladder tends to be more on the motor aspect. And so when you walk through some symptoms, people who present with bladder pain, this is a sensory condition. It's really kind of more, there's something in my bladder, I feel it all the time. Now, urinary frequency also, I think, tends to have a little bit of overlap, but many times it's interstitial cystitis. I just can't feel like I'm emptying. There's something there all the time. Overactive bladder tends to have a little bit more of uh, hard to delay urination, and so I can't get there quick enough. I have a quick instance of, uh, of symptoms that come on and I need to get to the toilet. And urgent continence is the pure motor. You know, uh, Hunter's ulcer, high on the sensory aspect, which would be a diagnostic of interstitial cystitis. Neurogenic overactive bladder tends to be more on the motor side of urgent continence. I think that's a good way to be thinking about the two conditions, sensory versus motor, with some overlap in the middle looking at kind of a model of well, how do we differentiate this on sort of a cellular level. So this is somewhat uh, of, of a black box and built a lot of it on uh, animal models. But really briefly, if you think about it, so the bladder, when it fills up, there's receptors that determine stretch and determine pressure. Okay, and once those are activated, it kind of filters down through the urothelium, signaling occurs, and in normal filling, A fibers, um, which are the, uh, uh, um, located right within the kind of lamina propria and detrusor interface. These carry this information of pressure and stretch up to the brain. Disruption of this tends to be kind of what we see more in overactive bladder. There's a disruption of kind of this normal feeling of stretch and pressure, and then it necessitates a motor response, which then causes the bladder to empty. 
But if you think about inflammation, which is the other set of sensors within the bladder, something like infection, injury, uh, interstitial cystitis, what that happens is, is that that signal filters down through, tends to activate some things in the lamina propria, specifically some of the mast cells, and it activates instead the C fibers, which are the unmyelinated fibers. And so we think that on a, on a, a cellular level, there may be a different signaling pattern for each one of these. Again, overactive bladder tends to be more of a motor response, and so it's activating the, the sensory uh, A fibers, whereas the pain and temperature irritation tends to be more of the C fibers. But it's probably more complicated than that. There's probably also some differences among the neurologic system, too. Now, when we're thinking about overactive bladder, you know, the uh, information of the afferent nerves is carried through you know, the uh, uh, pudendal on the pelvic nerve. It reaches uh, uh, sacrum, goes up through the spinal thalamic tract, and reaches the periaqueductal gray region within the midbrain. Now, when the bladder is filling up, the brain is, pro is constantly processing this. It's filtering things through the anterior uh, signaling cortex, through the prefrontal, cor uh, prefrontal cortex. And it's attaching significance to this bladder filling, time, space, what you're doing, what time of day things are. And when the bladder is filling, an inhibitory signal is sent to the pontine micturition complex in yellow there. When the bladder is being told to hold, then the sympathetic nervous system is activated and bladder stretches out. But when you need to pee, what ends up happening is the inhibitory signal is, is removed from the pontimicturition complex, and the parasympathetic system is activated. Bladder contracts. And so if you think about a, now a neurologic model of overactive bladder, what can happen sometimes is, is that this signaling between the pontimicturition complex and the uh, uh, periaqueductal gray is disruptive. That's why people with strokes can get overactive bladder. That's why multiple sclerosis people have overactive bladder. There's a disruption of this inhibitory signal. But there's probably a more common pathway also somewhere within the spine. What ends up happening is, is that there's a short somewhere between the afferents and the efferents, and you know, likely if you have some aberrant uh, or problems at the level of the bladder, it's initiating a reflex contraction, which then causes overactive bladder. And so there's likely something within the spinal cord also that's creating a short circuit where the brain is not filtering this information properly. And that's kind of a neurologic model for overactive bladder. Now, if you think about pain, it's probably a different processing. Again, afferents are uh, communicating to the uh, spinal cord, and this is brought up to the brain. And what we've kind of noticed is, is that in different kind of MRI studies, there's probably a little bit of a difference in some of the areas of the pain processing and potentially people who have either pain disorders or possibly even interstitial cystitis. So if you look at like the hypothalamus, the amygdala, um, kind of look at the uh, uh, thalamus, these areas are probably interpreting the signal differently. And that may be why on a kind of a level that people are constantly feeling pain, pressure, something with their bladder. So maybe again, a sensory processing problem with interstitial cystitis. And that's again, a neurologic way to maybe differentiate between the two. So how do we work up? How do we change, how do we make the diagnosis between the two? Well, I think we fall back to guidelines a little bit for consistency, so we're not reinventing the wheel each time. And if we go to the latest guidelines, 2019 overactive bladder, really the overactive bladder is diagnosed as a clinical diagnosis. And we really focus on physical exam, urinalysis, and avoiding diary. And avoiding diary, I think, is incredibly helpful just to be able to define out of where the symptoms are happening. Interestingly, as part of this diagnosis, really post-void residual is not part of it. And this is based on a couple of studies that are mentioned within the guidelines that eleva elevated post-void residual is, is relatively uncommon, particularly in women with overactive bladder symptoms. And also, it doesn't seem to track particularly well with quality of life measurements. And so, I'm not saying you shouldn't get a uh, you know, post-void residual. I find it can be helpful, particularly if the symptoms match. But it's not necessary to make the diagnosis or as a screening thing for overactive bladder. And so over, uh, urodynamics also, I think, can be very helpful, but again, not necessary for it. And overactive bladder is defined as, uh, I'm sorry, detrusor overactivity in urodynamics is defined as a greater than five centimeter pressure rise when you're doing the uh, CMG. And I think it's important to note, though, that you don't need to show overactive bladder through detrusor overactivity. And there's some good studies to show a disparity there. So if you do urodynamics and somebody does have overactive, uh, or does have a detrusor contraction, detrusor overactivity defined as uh, symptomatic rise of five centimeters or more, you know, it's pathognomonic of overactive bladder. So if you see these contractions on urodynamics, patient does have some element of overactive bladder. However, if you don't, it doesn't mean they don't have it. Um, there's a good study here that's from Chung 2011 that shows something about 36 of patients who had really clinically strong diagnosis of overactive bladder didn't show any detrusor overactivity in urodynamics. And so you don't need it, and you probably shouldn't use it as a screening tool for this. 
I think from, if you go back to our other slide, likely I think what's happening in some of this, you're getting such sympathetic drive during aerodynamics that it may be actually overwhelming and making the bladder relax. Something to think a little bit about, but use urodynamics appropriately. Now looking at interstitial cystitis, um, very broad sometimes categorized of, of how to actually make this. And this is again looking through different uh, uh, guideline statements and how to actually include what includes the diagnosis of interstitial cystitis. And so going through this, you know, I kind of summarize it here, really physical exam, good history of symptoms, um, urinalysis, urine culture. Interesting, urine cytology is commonly mentioned through this. We're moving away from that now. The actual number of people who have positive uh, urine cytology is, is very, very low in interstitial cystitis, but it is mentioned in many guidelines. Um, in the past, there was some discussion about a potassium challenge, really not recommended anymore for the diagnosis of IC. So again, a clinical diagnosis, but again, focusing on the history, kind of more of a constant sensation within the bladder, pain, differentiating from an urge or an inability to delay urination. Moving on to treatment here, um, think about overactive bladder treatment as a ladder, starting with behavioral therapy, moving to medications, then moving to third-line therapy if it, these aren't effective. So you're moving sequentially through the different, through the different uh, treatment steps with it. Um, I think a good way if you're going to uh, track out outcomes, uh, really focus on patient-reported outcome measures. And you know, the reason why I kind of bring this up is, is that sometimes it's very difficult to figure out what symptoms you're trying to treat, what's important to the patient. I think if you pick a specific group of symptoms and define it with the patient with a patient report outcome measure, it could be a questionnaire, it could be a common question that, you're common, that, that you use each time for patients, it allows you to track it to see whether or not they're getting better. Um, overactive bladder interstitial cystitis really can't be looked at as a yes, no answer. It can't be either it's fixed or it's broken. You have to look at a gradation of improvement and really educate the patient on where you are on those goals. And, Using some type of an outcome measure, I think, is really important for that. So a word on behavioral therapy. Um, behavioral therapy, I think, is fantastic for both interstitial cystitis and for overactive bladder. And really what this is, is, is repetition. So if you're thinking about overactive bladder, you're thinking about a motor response here. This is muscle training. It's repetitive muscle training that's potentiating a neurologic response to some degree. There's really good data to show that you can have some improvement with it. You know, there's a short-term cure, I guess you can define very loosely, um, in many, in, in the study from 1981 followed up in 2000, that showed people significantly improve by just having them watch their fluid, doing progressive time voiding, emptying their bladder regularly. We talked briefly about weight loss yesterday. Um, this is a diagnosis also where there is some good data to show that people who do have some weight loss can have some improvement of their symptoms. And again, this may be just self-care, just maybe more they're paying attention more to uh, uh, filling and emptying their bladder, but some good data to show that you know, if you do some calorie restrictions for people, 1,000 calories tends to be a little unmanageable for most people, but if you do some type of a calorie restriction, some diet, there's some reasonable improvement that people can have with overactive bladder symptoms. Biofeedback also, I think, really has good data behind it. Physical therapist is important for this to be able to have a regimented treatment plan for it, and that can be limiting for some people, but really giving some people some repetitive tools storage, emptying, exercises, can really have some demonstrable improvement with it. Again, not a cure generally, meaning that it's a yes, no answer, but a building block on a way to improvement. So overactive bladder medications, this is probably the bane of many people's existence. It's difficult to figure out what insurance is covering for what. I think the big summary on this, there's no real clear winner as to who um, is, what medication is, is the best for overactive bladder. But I can give you a couple of pro tips here. I think that first thing is, is that people come in and say their medications aren't working, particularly anticholinergics. The first thing to do is just define what are their expectations for. What we found, and we have some data we're going to publish later, is that many people with overactive bladder tend to look at it like an antibiotic. You take a pill, the symptoms should go away. So really ask them, like, what were you expecting? And most of the time, improvement is somewhere between one to three voids per day. And if they're not meeting those, if that's not their expectation, it's going to be a failure. The second pro tip is, is that if they say it's not working, particularly anticholinergics and muscarinics, look at their medications. Because what happens with anticholinergics is that they're processed through the liver and the cytochrome P450 system, and that is com com competitive with other medications. Warfarin, uh, statins, uh, antipsychotics actually also compete for that enzyme system. And so what can happen sometimes if they're on multiple medications is that the anticholinergic just isn't activated. If that's the case, switch actually to trospium chloride, which is renally processed, and it kind of gets rid of that system. 
and you don't have to use it. So those are two kind of uh, 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 tips to be able to kind of help manage this. I think with anticholinergic comparison, if you kind of look at things here, um, there's a discontinuation rate that's very high, and um, you can see that it's up to 80% in a study here. Cochrane Review really shows that, and this is the uh, kind of board review and the recertification question here, is that uh, um, if you look at all the medications, long-acting ones work better than short, and uh, um, there's probably increased efficacy, efficacy with the longer-acting ones. Really quickly, this is something that pa patients bring up. It was a JAMA study about anticholinergics and the risk of, uh, of dementia. Um, really what this showed was that in a cohort, which, they, uh, which was a cross-sectional one, they followed and there was a 50% increase uh, 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 risk of having uh, uh, increased odds of, of a dementia associated in this cohort. So this is not a uh, causal um, relationship, but what they did see is an association there. And I think more work needs to be done on this. This was a medication, uh, this was a study that did, didn't differentiate type of anticholinergic and uh, could just be that people with dementia were taking more of these medications. But patients will bring this up and it's important to kind of think a little bit about the implications long term. So interstitial cystitis, I think you differentiate by treatment Whereas overactive bladder is a ladder, interstitial cystitis is, is, is a grab bag. You just kind of look at what you think is going to work and be able to help. So you can start at any point within the treatment, uh, um, your treatment tools uh, uh, for it. And really counseling patients is very important. So when you're talking about, again, the treatment, again, we talked a little bit about managing pain. This is good expectation management. There's several different medications that are out there. None of them have really great data. They're reasonable to try, but if you're, if you're talking about particularly Elmeron, um, there's a, a macular de de degeneration has been kind of shown to be associated with it. That's a good conversation to have. If people are on it, you don't need to stop it. It may not, may not be something that you want to be starting looking forward with it. And finally, installations can be uh, uh, helpful, again, with the right selected patient. So moving on now to, to uh, uh, other, the third line treatment, neuromodulation, um, very effective and it's been lots of studies. We won't spend a lot of time on the efficacy, but you know, there tends to be a good follow through in people who have a good first stage or a P and E test moving on to a second stage and that's been well documented and established. A posterior tibial nerve stimulation I think has a little bit better data, some a little bit uh, meta, better data on that meta-analysis. There's uh, showing that there's about 2.5 reduction in voids per day, night. I think this is a durable treatment, but it needs uh, once a week for 12 weeks, 30-minute uh, treatment, and it can be very time-dependent. Neuromodulation, what about in interstitial cystitis? Um, there's a good, again, kind of systematic review here in meta-analysis. Uh, 14 studies that uh, met the criteria in this, and uh, what they ultimately showed was that it was very, it could be effective in reducing urinary frequency. And this is really important to differentiate for your patients. If you're going to offer them neuromodulation, you really need to kind of focus on it's going to help with feeling like you need to pee. The pain is not necessarily going to improve. PTNS, there's almost no data on. Finally, finish up with botulism toxin, overactive bladder, 100 units. Um, a lot of good data showing that it's effective. You know, almost three voids change per day versus two in a placebo. Um, I think it's also important that it may have a higher complication rate. And it was a nice study that's uh, published 2021 here that shows that the adverse rate was higher uh, within the first six months um, you know, with Botox, and that's mostly infection and retention. And Botox also is going to last somewhere between three and 12 months. It's going to need multiple injections, and that's education for the patient. So interstitial cystitis, um, interestingly, almost no studies showing the efficacy of it, probably because there's probably not insurance approved for it when it's coded for interstitial cystitis. But when I looked up the uh, clinical trials uh, uh, website, there was one in 2012, 25 patients, and it really, I didn't see the outcomes for that. And then there's a clinical trial accruing comparing it to installation, but there's, there's very little data on it, and I'd use that with caution. So in summary, you know, these symptoms, these conditions are very prevalent. I think, think about your diagnosis, sensory, interstitial cystitis, motor, overactive bladder with some overlap. Use your therapy ladder in the uh, uh, overactive bladder in a grab bag for interstitial cystitis. Fall back on the guidelines, it kind of helps give some uh, uh, guidance and some evidence. And you know, for third line therapy, more data to show it's effective with overactive bladder, but neuromodulation may be something to explore, particularly for interstitial cystitis with urinary symptoms. Thank you very much.